Oh, what a mess. This is Neil Schneider from Meant to Be Seen. Welcome back to my messy basement. So this week we're going to be doing something very special. Black Friday is just around the bend and I thought it would be the perfect time to put together a virtual reality shopping guide. Uh, the thing is this guide isn't for technical people. I wanted something designed for people that didn't necessarily know the first thing about computers, they didn't know the first thing about virtual reality, but they wanted to learn more. And if we do a good job with this, You'll have more than enough information to go to the store, buy what you need, take it home, and start enjoying virtual reality right away. And, I, and I'm hopeful that uh, you're as excited about VR as we are, um, because it, it, it's, just, it's just a lot of fun, and it's, it's really exciting technology. So what are we going to cover in this, uh, in this guide? Well, I'm going to give you an introduction to virtual reality. What is it? What can you do with it? Who is it right for? Because it, it really, it's not right for everybody, but, but most people could very well enjoy it. Um, we're going to talk about the different solutions in the market. Which one is right for you? So for example, to my left, this is an HTC Vive. It's for a personal computer. This is a Samsung Gear VR, which works on a smartphone. We're going to talk about the Sony PlayStation VR solution for you know, Sony PlayStation console. Um, there's also the Oculus Rift CV1. So there's all kinds of solutions in the market. We're going to talk about them, what they mean for you and you know which is ultimately the right solution to buy and if you are choosing to buy virtual reality on your personal computer on your pc which is arguably the most advanced form of virtual reality it's affordable but it is advanced we're going to talk about you know what's needed to get started i mean maybe you know one of the big decision factors is your computer is your computer powerful enough um, if it, if not can you upgrade it if you have to and if you have to upgrade it, how do you go about doing that? Um, if an upgrade isn't enough, you'll need to do some shopping. So we're going to talk about the deals in the market. Do you need a bundled computer? Do you need to just buy a computer on your own? We're going to talk about all these things, even how to protect yourself when shopping. So I'm going to give you my shopping advice there as well. And, but I want to remind you, this isn't going to be technical. I, I, I wanted this to be something that anyone can, can watch and appreciate and benefit from. However, if after this guide you want to learn more, we've also included a quick, I call it an IT lesson. Uh, it only takes a few minutes and you'll literally understand everything inside your computer. Um, so, and it's helpful to know that even when you're shopping, just to have some basic, a basic understanding of how things work is very helpful. But it's not required, but it's helpful. So, and the last piece is we've got, um, you know, sure, you buy a virtual reality headset, perhaps you get a computer and a console. There's still some odds and ends that would be very helpful to you to even to enjoy your virtual reality experience even further. So we'll talk about that as well. So let's begin. What is virtual reality? Well, virtual reality is an illusion. I mean, that's what it is. You're you're, and it's the illusion of being in a fantasy world. It doesn't have to be a fantasy world. It could be a recreation of, of, of something in real life. But the point is that you're somewhere else. You're seemingly somewhere else. So um, I would describe it as being the difference between seeing something and literally being in that, in that virtual world. So right now, you're watching me probably on a YouTube video. If this was in true virtual reality, uh, it would seem that we were in the same room. And you'd have that same similar sensations to being in the same room. Um, when virtual reality is done really, really well, uh, it's, it's usually referred to as, or, or what's achieved is usually referred to as presence. Okay? So the way I would describe presence is, you're, you know, let's say you're, you're wearing a head-mounted display, and you're in this virtual world, and you see a big chasm in front of you. Okay? Your conscious mind will say, ah, don't worry about it, it's not real. Okay? But your body will have a very different opinion. You, you, know, you try to walk across that chasm and you'll find yourself hesitating. Maybe you'll tap the floor a little bit just to make sure you're, you're walking on, on solid ground because it's that convincing. That's what, what presence is. And it's, you know, if you're dealing with really good virtual reality equipment, well-written software and, and content experiences, it's very achievable and is, is very rewarding. 
So how do we achieve this presence? How do we achieve these convincing virtual reality experiences? So there's different factors that make this possible. First off is resolution. So resolution refers to the number of dots on the screen. So you, you literally build up the image with dots on a screen. It's your, you know, it's your, it's your building blocks, okay? And the more you have to work with, the more clear, the clearer the image is, the more realistic it appears. Next would be tracking. So it's not just about wearing a head mounted display and being in a virtual reality experience. What happens is that experience changes according to you know, what you're looking at and how you're looking at it when you're moving your head, whether you're moving your body. Depending on the type of tracking being done, it detects this information and, and adjusts the environment accordingly. So there's, there's two primary forms of tracking. The first is what we call orientational tracking. So this usually just covers your head. So you know when you turn your head left and right, you look up and down, or maybe you tilt it, or we call it rolling. That's what we would refer to as orientational tracking. It's the most um, basic form of tracking in virtual reality. Then the next level up actually is, is positional. So positional tracking is you literally pick up every nuance or the system picks up every nuance of how you're positioned in virtual reality. And I'm, I'm not talking about your legs and your limbs. I'm more like, let's say if you're leaning forward and backward and side to side, every nuance of how of where you're facing, where you're looking is picked up and the environment adjusts accordingly. It's very, very convincing. The, the last option or the final option is what we call room scale. So right now I'm in a seated experience. The majority of, of uh, virtual reality devices promote a seated experience, but there are a handful or the more or the most advanced versions of this where you could physically walk around the room with your head mounted display on and it you know, this is mimicked in the virtual reality world. You're walking around the virtual reality space, um, you know, in tandem with what you're doing in the physical world. So it's very exciting technology um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's very rewarding. So again, orientational, positional, and room scale. Performance, very important. So um, one of the big challenges with virtual reality is it takes a lot of processing power. I mean, whether you're using a smartphone, whether you're using a gaming console like the Sony PlayStation, or if you're using a personal computer, it's very important that the imagery in virtual reality is smooth and it's accurate. If it gets lumpy, if, it, if the performance isn't quite right, uh, it could, you know, you run the risk of having motion sickness or the, or the experience isn't as convincing as it could be. So that's why so much attention is placed on the performance of the hardware um, in, in virtual reality. Stereoscopic 3D, this is very important. So we have, we have two eyes for a reason, okay? If you, if you were to close one eye at a time, you'd see that each eye has a unique perspective. And what happens is we, our brain gets our left and right perspective and, and um, merges it into a single, what we call a stereoscopic 3D image. And the reason this is important is if you're looking at objects up close, you literally see every nuance. You get a sense of things coming towards you or, or there's a big sense of depth. Really a very important sense of uh, realism. And you can get some content, there is some content in virtual reality that doesn't have that stereoscopic 3D feature, but it, it, you know, a, a fair bit is lost without it. It's, it's, in my opinion, stereoscopic 3D is very important, which makes it a core feature of, of virtual reality and achieving that presence. Um, finally, we have interaction. Just like we have two eyes, uh, we have two hands for a very good reason. Um, sure, it's great, you know, you're, if you wear a head mount display and you're in this environment, whether you're sitting or walking and you're looking around, yeah, it's very interesting for sure. But it's even more rewarding is if you can, if you could grab things and, and look at them from, you know, all kinds of angles. So like, for example, these are the HTC Vive controllers. And of course, Oculus has their touch controllers and Sony PlayStation has their move controllers. And, but the, the concept's the same, that in virtual reality, those controllers suddenly become your hands. 
and you could lift things and look at things and and press buttons and it's it's just it's really rewarding it's really rewarding which is which is why it's so vital in uh, virtual reality so there's there's uh, three different classes of uh, virtual reality devices the first is mobile so this refer usually primarily refers to uh, devices that combine with smartphones. So this is, we're going to talk about this a little bit later in the show, but this is a, a, a Samsung Gear VR. What happens is you put a, a, a smartphone in it, in particular a Samsung smartphone in it, and combined with a sensor and the lenses in the device, you get a virtual reality experience through your smartphone. And it, the type of tracking, it, the, the nature of its tracking is limited. So it, it uses what we call orientational tracking, which means that you know we get the head movements, but we don't have all the nuances if you were to move forward and backward and you know in different directions. So um, impressive, but uh, limited in nature. Um, but it's also, as far as the content's concerned, it's also the simplest content relative to the other options. So when I say simple, I don't mean that it's not entertaining and it's not, you know, it's not beneficial. It's just simple. The graphics are simpler. You're going to see a lot more um, 360 content, which we'll talk about later. So a lot of cinema work and broadcasting. Um, but again, it, it's relatively simple compared to what you'd get with the more uh, advanced solutions. There's also limited interaction. There, that will change. Uh, that will change in the not too distant future, but for now, um, the interaction is you, you, you know, in this ca case of the Samsung Gear VR is you have a touchpad and you could, you know, you can move around kind of like a mouse depending on what you're looking at, but you don't have the same hand controllers and gesture control that you would have with the more advanced devices. But um, what's, what's really neat about it is it's a good introductory level. This isn't the only solution. There's a Samsung Gear VR, there's the Immersion Varelia Go, Google Daydream was just announced with their Pixel phone. So, um, it's a wide market in the mobile space, and we're going to talk about that later in the program. Um, but I just want to highlight, mobile by far is the most inexpensive means of getting involved in virtual reality. So next is console, and we're going to talk about uh, console in more detail later in, in the guide. But uh, today, console is primarily focused on the Sony PlayStation VR solution. This is a mid-level uh, tracking solution. Okay, So before, I described this as mobile being limited to what we call orientational tracking. In the case of the PlayStation VR, it has positional tracking, which means that it will pick up the nuances of how your body is positioned in this digital environment. The catch is it's not room scale, so that's as far as it goes. You have very limited, you could stand up, you could walk around just a little bit, but it's really primarily a positional tracking solution. Very rewarding, okay? It's designed to be in the living room, but just be aware that it's, it's positional. You, do, you don't really have that room scale ability. And one of the big benefits behind console-based virtual reality, in this case Sony PlayStation VR, is it's, it's very simple to install. I mean, you, you buy it at the local store, you bring it home, you put it on your PlayStation 4. I mean, you, you got to connect things up, but it's, it's, it's easily one of the easiest methods. It's also um, relatively inexpensive. It doesn't require a powerful computer. You may already have the console that you need in your home, so it's uh, you know, so we're, and we're going to talk about that a bit later. Actually, um, Kevin Carbot from Tom's Hardware is going to tell us about the PlayStation VR. Give his personal review of what you can and can't do with it. Um, but just want to highlight one of the big advantages with with working with a console, co uh, Sony in particular, is they've got AAA content, meaning that high-end video game content is coming down the pipe. So we're really excited about that. So that's console. The final category of virtual reality is personal computer. And when we're talking about a personal computer, we're talking about a gaming level computer. So I would describe this as a mid to high level desktop or notebook computer. Usually it's desktop. There are capable notebook computers, but most of it is, is done through uh, desktop computers. And um, you know, you may be able to upgrade what you already have, and we're going to talk about that later in the guide. But you, it's, it's also equally possible that you're going to have to buy a, a new machine. And it, it is an investment, but it's a worthwhile investment. 
And the advance, one of some of the big advantages of, of personal computer-based virtual reality is in the case of the HTC Vive, which we have here, Oculus is introducing this with their touch controllers plus an additional camera. Um, they're introducing room scale tracking. So you could literally, if you have enough space in your basement or a part of your home or office, you can walk around in virtual reality. And the interaction, the nature of the interaction that you get in virtual reality is by far the best of the solutions. But just be aware, it's also considered the highest tier investment and we're gonna talk about you know, the pricing and how to save some money later later on in, in the guide. Um, something I do like about the PC market, it's kind of a double-edged sword just to be aware of it, is it, it, it does have more content. There is more content readily available in the PC solution than the, than the you know, mobile and um, uh, console. Okay, but also be aware that it's not equally good. It's not vetted out the same way content is on, on, on console. So you, you may have to weed through to find the best experiences, but there's more readily available on PC, which makes it a very good uh, platform. So just to highlight, just a reminder, the big platforms in the PC world right now are the, the Oculus Rift CV1 and the HTC Vive which are both readily available in retail, and of course you could order them online as well. And we're gonna talk about that a little later in the guide. So great, you got all this hardware. I mean, you look at my messy basement here, I obviously got a lot of stuff here. What can you ultimately do with it? Well, there's a different classes of content in virtual reality. First, by far, video games. It's e they are easily the most immersive and convincing option for virtual reality today. At least that's been my experience. And there's all kinds of games available in this market. Um, I know personally I've been trying dog fighting games and space combat games where you're literally in the cockpit of an airplane or, 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 or a spaceship. There's racing games. There's interactive strategy games where you know, you have a map and you could literally look around and you, you know, use your controllers to, you know, to decide where things go. Um, you could even go mountain climbing if you had to. So it's really, really exciting stuff in the game market. And of course, there's more to come. And I've, you know, I'm just going to highlight some games I've been playing and, you know, I haven't been able to get to all of it, but there's, there's a lot, because there's a lot out there. Um, when you buy an HTC Vive, for example, one of the default uh, programs they include is the lab. And you could have like, you know, you could slingshot and you knock things down in virtual reality, but they do it in a really fun way. You have to see it. Um, another game, the gallery call of the star seed. It's, you know, the game's probably going to take you longer to play than normal because you're going to be busy picking things up and looking at them and, you know, examining them. And so it's, the graphics are really, really impressive. Um, a game I've, been enjoying recently is Elite Dangerous and well actually two games Elite Dangerous and Eve Valkyrie so this is this kind of reminds me of like Battlestar Galactica where you're in a starship I guess yeah I guess you could say Battlestar Galactica I hope that's not too old a reference but anyway and you're sitting in a cockpit and you're literally fighting other ships in space and it's it's quite it's really something else that you're looking around your cockpit and you're you, it's not that you're looking at a cockpit you're sitting in the cockpit and uh, you get a sense of depth and you see your, all your space controls and all. It's a lot of fun. It really is a lot of fun and it's memorable. Another big area is what we call uh, social, all right? So social in the VR world is metaverse, okay? You've probably heard of these, these metaverse platforms, like you're, you're gonna be in the metaverse. Well, what it is is that it's, think of it as a digital network um, where people talk to each other. So, um, in, you know, we have what we call avatars and, and you can see like digital recreations of, of yourself. Maybe you're a cartoon character, maybe you're, you're someone else. But the point is you interact with other people uh, as avatars. And some of the most popular examples of this include Outspace VR and VR Chat, And there are others. There's others coming to market as well. Um, and, but it's not just about interacting with other people. What makes it cool is they do things like they do virtual reality concerts and, and they'll have parties and, and you know, if ho hopefully, uh, you know, when there's enough people in the community, you, you get to meet like-minded people, you know, from all over the world. So it's, it, it adds something. It, it's more than, you know, just chatting on the line or sending an email. It's a very much a social uh, gathering from people all over the world. And uh, it's early stage, 
But the, the infrastructure, the way they make these things work is really quite incredible. So I, I, I encourage you to try it. It's something different. Now, uh, another big area is what we call 360 cinema or broadcasting. So what this is, is they use special cameras. Okay, so normally I'm, I'm just using a regular camera to shoot this. But if I, if I had a, a 360 camera, what it would be is you'd have the camera, but it would shoot all around, up, down, all around in, in a full 360 degrees. So if, if I had a camera like that at a rock concert, when you watch that concert through your virtual reality device, it would almost seem as though you were right there, where you could literally like look around and see from all angles, and you'd have the best seat in the house. Now, um, it, the catch is most a lot of the 360 content is isn't in three. In, in, sorry, let me rephrase that. A lot of the 360 content is in 2D. They don't they don't yet have the benefit of having a stereoscopic view, which we talked about before. It's still good content. You know, there's a lot of interesting stuff out there. In my opinion, though, the best stuff is the stereoscopic 3D content because it's just that much more uh, convincing when it's done well. And the technology is, is just getting better and better. Um, so just keep an eye out. You're going to see 360 movies, 360 experiences, exclusives. It, it, it's, going to be, it, it's going to be something else. Uh, next, education. Okay, we've talked about games, we've talked about cinema broadcasting, uh, we, we've talked about social. So education, of course, is very important. Um, you know, the thing about virtual reality is it makes the content exciting, it's very helpful for complexing, sorry, it's very helpful for communicating uh, complex ideas in fun ways. One of the experiences I saw which was interesting was something called The Body where you're literally getting a tour of inside the human body and it's telling you how the genome works and how, how uh, human cells fight off, fight off disease. Very interesting, um, uh, very convincing. So, uh, and, and this is just one example. I think we'll all be dissecting frogs in, in virtual reality one day. Um, another thing, w w which is a, call it an experimental direction, is, virtual, is a new era of virtual reality journalism. And the idea is that using 360 cameras and special techniques, you can see other parts of the world as though you're there. I mean, that's the ultimate, that's the ultimate goal. So you, hopefully you would empathize with what's happening in other parts of the world more than you would through a traditional newscast. And then finally, you've got these uh, general virtual reality experiences. And, and what it is, is it's just, it's just great virtual reality entertainment in a class by itself. So um, I'll give you an example. Uh, Oculus did Henry, which is a story of a of a of a porcupine. I hope I'm getting the animal right, but it's I know like I've seen it, but it's got all kinds of spikes, and you're trying to empathize with this animal on his birthday that no one wants to hug him because they get hurt. So anyway, so that's just an example. But there's much much more, and it's it's really a new class of hedgehog. That's what I was looking for. That's the word I was looking for, Henry the Hedgehog. But anyway. There's much, much more content uh, to look forward to. Now, big question. Wow, this sounds really great. You got video games and education and 360 broadcasting and journalism. Who is this best suited for? Well, most vendors, so when I'm saying, and when I'm talking about the vendors, I'm referring to Oculus and Valve and and, and Sony, the majority of them are recommending 13 years and older, some say 12 and older, but nonetheless, I'm going to just say 13 and older. So why is that the case? Well, if we look at the physicality of the device, you've got these lenses, okay? And it's important that they're, they're properly aligned with your eyes. They, they call it an interpupillary distance, okay? So it's very important, first and foremost, that the hardware is comfortable to use. Um, the other thing to think about is, as I mentioned, when these virtual reality experiences are done well, they're very convincing. So when we're, talk when we're dealing with very young children, you know, they may not respond well. We have, to be, we have to be responsible. Even if it's, you know, friendly content, we, it has to be handled responsibly. So, you know, it, it is a bit, I admit, it is a bit arbitrary that, that the age 13 and up was recommended, but that's the recommendation and, and you know, the market has reason for that. But I'm going to share with you my own reason for 13 years and older. Um, I showed my son 
one of the VR devices. And uh, I got to tell you, when you know, he had a great time. Actually, there were two problems. Problem number one was he enjoyed it so much, he kept bugging me that he wanted to use it again and again and again and again, and we didn't. Um, but that was problem number one, because they are going to enjoy it. And really, it's, I think it's more for the adult. The other, the other issue is this equipment is not cheap. I mean, it's, you know, it's an investment. And the last thing you need is a toddler having a tantrum and throwing your controllers on the floor. I mean, it, it's, you know, this stuff has to be taken care of and it has to be handled responsibly. So um, this, you know, this is another good cause for 13 and over. So again, virtual reality, responsible teenagers and adults. That's my recommendation.